was beautiful. Thank you guys so much. Before I pray and before I get into my message today, I want to share an anecdote. <clears throat> um, we've been singing uh, House of the Lord here recently, and uh, I enjoy that song. I, I hope the rest of you enjoy it as well. It's kind of new for some of us. I think the first time I heard it was VBS. Wasn't that one of the songs in VBS? Not this year, but last year? This year? It was this year's VBS? I, has it already been that long? <laughs> Sometimes the, the brain does tricks on you. Um, there's a line in the song that, that says, um, our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Right? You know, that we're not going to be quiet. We're not going to shout. Um, as a, a person who's been involved in, in, in ecclesiology and the, the history of the church for many years, I, I follow trends and patterns and historical developments of how things happen in the church. Now, I know I'm not as old as everyone here. I'm probably kind of in the middle. I'm only 26, and there's a few of you under me. Well, did I say that? I am in the house of the Lord, baby. <laughs> I shouldn't lie. <laughs> I'm a little bit older than 26. Um, but when I was growing up in the church, the main emphasis of many songs was about being quiet in church. Uh, we would sing in the secret, right? In the quiet place, in the stillness, you are there. Um, uh, Newsboys, their very first album that made Newsboys popular, one of their very most popular songs was Be Still and Know That I Am God. You remember that? Be still and know He. Sing with me. No, okay, never mind. Uh, Anyways, and there's nothing wrong with that, guys. There's nothing wrong. There is a time, and the Bible talks about the preciousness of silence and being quiet, being reverent, and, and uh, uh, you, know, you, know, uh, you know, the waiting and, and the quiet and the secret and all that. But we are now at the 30th anniversary of a monumental shift that took place in Christian worship. In 1993, a young and shy, damaged young lady approached a church in Australia and asked if she could sing with them. Her name was Darlene. She had been through many struggles. She'd been bulimic as a teenager. She had watched her parents go through many problems. She was having some relation problems, relationship financial problems, but she felt that God had given her a song. In one of the stories she tells, she says she sat down on the piano and within eight minutes she had the entire song written. And she just felt this compulsion. She'd done some music uh, professionally. She'd done some jingles for commercials and done little things like that. But in her mid-20s, she approaches a church in Australia. She was not part of the worship team at the time, but she asked the head of, of music, can I share a song with you? His name was Jeff Bullock. And Jeff said, I'd love to hear this song. Go ahead and share it with me. She was so embarrassed, she says, you can't look at me. Don't look at me. Turn around and look at the wall, and I'll play the piano and sing for you. And he said, well, okay. So Jeff Bullock turned around, and Darling Check played, Shout to the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. She was so nervous, she was shaking, her voice was quaking. He said, that song is inspired. And Hillsong's music began to play, and Darling Check became part of, of the music environment there at Hillsongs. And now Shout to the Lord, 30 years ago, is one of the most popular songs. We used to sing it a lot in church, you know, uh, but you sing a song too much, you kind of retire it and bring it out. But just singing House of the Lord reminded me that because of God's working through a young lady in Australia 30 years ago, now the church, which did not sing that way, in my experience and in much of, of the Christian world. We did not sing about shouting to the Lord before God let a young lady inspire her with a song that said, shout to the Lord. And now because of that, 30 years later, we can sing things like, we will not be quiet. We shout at your name. I am glad that God still works through people and that God still brings messages to his church through people willing to listen to his spirit. Amen? So I, I admire Darlene Check. I, I've admired her for years. And I'm glad that God used her and inspired a whole new generation of praise music. I'm not saying you have to love the song, like the song, 
but it did make a, a wonderful change that uh, God used. Paul says in the book of Colossians, devote yourselves to prayer. He's wrapping up his message to the church in Colossus, and he's ending with some advice, and he says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert, keeping alert in it, being alert in prayer. It's an interesting thing to say, alert for what? And with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open to us a door for the word. That was the alertness. When you pray, Pray so that God would give you the awareness and, alert and alertness so when the time comes, you're ready to share his gospel and his truth with people so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I've also been in prison, that I may make it, that's the mystery of Christ, that I may make the mystery of Christ clear in the way that I ought to speak. Devote yourselves to prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just continue in a spirit of worship and reverence right now. We want you to bless us, speak to us, and change us, Father, into your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul will continue with this train of thought in the next verses. He says, Conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Paul does not want the church to be an isolated group of people separate from the world. He wants the church to know its responsibilities within the world that it is a part of, making the most of the opportunity. And then he says this, let your speech always be with grace. Now, I don't know about you. That's a tough ask. Is your speech always filled with grace church when you speak to your children when you when you speak to your co-workers when you speak to the person who cuts you off on the road is it always with grace let your speech always be with grace now i'm a pastor so i've got this down i don't have a problem with this i'm so holy it just flows out of my mouth and it's just perfect all the time and one of these days, a lightning bolt's going to come and strike me dead while I preach. I'm being sarcastic, Drew. Don't get upset at me. It's a tough thing. Does Paul know what he's saying when he writes that? Let your speech all... He doesn't say most of the time. He doesn't say it at your holy times. He doesn't say it during Sabbath. He says, let your speech always be with grace. Now, that's a high calling, church. And he says it this way. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt. Now, normally if you call someone salty in our context today, it's not necessarily a compliment. You know, someone who's salty kind of means they're abrasive. They're, you know, uh, they kind of rub you the wrong way. But here Paul is using it in a positive context and he's saying it's okay to be salty. Be seasoned with salt. Let salt work its magic in your life to accomplish this high calling of making the most of ever, every opportunity and let your speech always be with grace so that you will know how you should respond to each person. All right, now that we've got the opening introduction, a couple of microphones here. Let's make it clear for Derek. Uh, pink and black. Need one more helper if I could get one more trained technician. Oh, Owen is racing to the uh, cause. Here, I'll just throw it to you. No, I won't. <laughs> I just made the seems heart jump. Hey, we're getting new equipment. Why don't we just throw this stuff around? How many known uses are there for salt? You know, salt, the stuff you put on your french fries? Is there a, a 10 or so, 50-ish, maybe around 150, 500, or 14,000? Julian? 14,000. Wow. Does he just always go to the extreme? Yes, he does. You know, he's right. Cordy, did you know there's a North American Salt Institute? I wonder what it's like to work there. <laughs> Where do you work? I work at the North American Salt Institute. 14,000 uses for salt, most of them industrial and commercial, but uh, salt does a lot of things. Number two, who in the Bible was turned into a pillar of salt? Did you know that someone was turned into a pillar of salt in the Bible? Now that person's salty. All right, I see Andre over here. Let's give Andre a chance. He may know. 
I kind of doubt it, but we'll give him a chance. No, Lot's I'm just kidding. Lot's wife. Oh, see, and I was picking on you right when you said He got it right, didn't he? Lot's wife, and there she is. No, that's not true. But there are a lot of these salt pillars uh, around the Dead Sea. There's these different geological formations. Um, there was fire and brimstone, the Bible, and the King James at least talks about that consumed Sodom and Gomorrah. Brimstone is just the old word for sulfur. That's just sulfur. And when sulfur reduces, it becomes sulfuric, sulfide salt. Ever use Epsom salt? Epsom salt is a sulfide salt. So you may have been using Lot's wife to soften your toes. And, oh, that's gross. That was the kind of salt that consumed and... In that sad story, the wife of Lot. In 2 Kings 2, Elisha purifies something with salt. What did he purify? Was it the land, water, bitter herbs? Was it a baby or his wife? Elisha purifies something. I'm looking for some young people here, part of the kids' quiz. I only see a couple participating. Kay is indicating her brother. Andre, man, you're so helpful over here. Andre, go ahead and tell us. What do you think? The spring of water. Hey, two for two. Is that what you were going to say, Julian? I knew it. You're right. So in the story, salt was known as a purifier. You could rub salt into a wound. It would clean the wound. Salt was used in makeup. Salt was used in perfume. So using salt was not a weird idea because it was a known element used to purify things. But of course, it was a miracle that God did through Elisha when he poured a little salt into the spring and the water became good. Number four, how is salt used in the sanctuary? Now, I know you kids, this is a lot of guesswork, okay? I understand that. These are kind of guesses. I see Adon with his hand up. Was it used for the incense at the altar of incense? Was it with the food offerings? Was it not used at all? Was it part of the priest's payment, their salary, or was it used as a symbol of redemption? B. B, he says. We're going to let a few others help out. Julian up front, and I see Isaiah, Owen. We want to get it in the microphone so everyone can hear. Right up here, Toby. And then I see Isaiah. Oh, so uh, several young men want to help out. Right, Isaiah? E. E, symbol of redemption. Yes? A. A, we're covering our bases here. Julian? D. D. We've covered everyone but one. And I'm going to put them together and give you group credit for that because you're all right. It was all of them except C. Salt was actually a regular part of the sacrificial system. Um, there are passages and traditions that suggest that you could not make any offering except the burnt offering unless it came with salt. Salt was required or expected for every offering. It was a critical part of the ministry of the sanctuary. There was even something called a covenant of salt. Um, that the Bible refers to on multiple times. So salt was a known symbol, and, and yes, it was a symbol of redemption because salt had a, a sense of eternalness. If you salted a field, it was as though that field could never grow again. It had this symbol of eternalness and, and being indissoluble. So um, it was used quite a bit. Last question, young people. Last question. In which Bible passage did Jesus say you're the salt of the earth? Was it when he fed the great group of 5,000? Is it in the story of the prodigal son or the Sermon on the Mount? Was it when he raised Lazarus or is it in the Great Commission? Ketsia's got her hand up. The Sermon of the, on the Mount. She got it. See how she waited to last to really show her wisdom and intelligence? You guys know this one, don't you? Oops. Sermon on the Mount. You, you've heard it before? I want us to look there. Thank you, Owen, and um, yes, my son, Toby. I didn't forget it. I was pausing for dramatic effect. The Sermon on the Mount. Here's how Jesus says it. You are the salt. You are the salt of the earth. The salt has become tasteless. How can it be made salty again? Notice he says, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Now, I'm returning to somewhat of a hobby horse of mine as a preacher. If, if you're getting tired of hearing these 
uh, messages, I apologize, but it's kind of one of my core uh, realities for the Christian disciple in really getting clear in our own personal walk. And you'll, you'll see where I'm going in just a second. I want you to know, so we're very familiar with the Sermon on the Mount. We, we, we've studied it before. We preached on it, had Bible studies. I get it. This is just immediately after the Beatitudes, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that mourn. Blessed are the meek. They shall inherit the earth. Blessed, 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 right? Okay. All these blessings, okay? And then the last one is blessed are you when you are persecuted. Uh, Great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who came before you. That's verse 12, right? The very next thing Jesus says is you are the salt. Now, I want you just to pause and think about this for a second. From the perspective of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' first public ministry or public declaration of his being the messiah he's done a few small things before that he's done some miracles he's been baptized but the sermon on the mount is the first serious public presentation and willingness for the messiah to be in front of the multitudes and to deliver the initial and the ultimate plan and message of god and he begins it beautifully with the beatitudes all these principles that even other religions look at the Beatitudes and say, those are wonderful. Gandhi, the Dalai Lama, uh, others have looked at the Beatitudes and said, those are wonderful virtues. We, we wish all of our people had those same virtues. And this very next statement, he gives us his very first metaphor. You are salt. So before being a fisherman, before the fig tree, uh, you know, before uh, you know, parables about farmers and, and a mustard seed, before all the other beautiful metaphors that Jesus gives us throughout his ministry, from the perspective of Matthew, the very first message, the very first metaphor that Jesus lays before the people after the Beatitudes is, you are the salt. Very interesting. Before we get anywhere else, you need to understand who you are in this earth, and you are the salt. Now, when he says, if you lose the saltiness, it's no longer good for anything. Remember, a lot of people love the Sermon on the Mount. Everyone except the Jews, (laughs) the very people Jesus was trying to reach. They hate the Sermon on the Mount because it challenges rabbinical tradition. It challenges oral tradition. It, It challenges the interpretations Uh, that the Jewish nation had put on the Old Testament. And when Jesus says it's no longer good for anything, he's making one of these dramatic allness statements. You're either salty or you're good for nothing. There's no middle ground. It's It's good if you're salty, but it's okay to not be salty. It's one or the other. You're either salt or you're nothing. And then when he says, except to be trampled by foot underground, it's very interesting. One of the last passages of the Old Testament, Malachi, right? Malachi, you know, you, you, you're a few pages in your Bible, you turn like three pages over and you're in Matthew, right? One of the very last passages of Malachi talks about how in the end, the wicked will be tread underfoot for they shall be ashes under our feet. The idea of being trampled, the idea of being tread upon was a dramatic Old Testament vision for what the wicked had happened to them. Jezebel was called upon to be thrown out of a window and to be trampled upon. Being trampled upon in the Jewish idea was about the most disgraceful, the most wretched situation you could be in. And Jesus, right here, this beautiful message of blessings, this beautiful message of of, of God for us, he says, you're either salty or nothing. Trampled upon. You're either salty or you're as good as Jezebel. You're either salty or you'll be like the wicked, tread under the foot in the last days. So this is not just a a kind of fun little analogy and metaphor. Oh, what does all that mean? It is a serious uh, uh, message, a serious sermon from Jesus Christ. You are the salt. Now, there's many ways that this can be analyzed and and, uh, emphasized and and illustrated. Um, Oh, I forgot to bring this up with me. I wanted to use this. 
I like salt. Do you guys like salt? You know, if you were to put a t- two tables in front of people with, with different snacks and goodies, and if on one table were all the sweets, the cookies, and the ice cream, and the chocolate, and then on the other table, all the salty stuff, the popcorn, and the chips, and the, the nachos, which one would you go to? How many, let me see the salty people out there. Ah, the rest of you are wicked. Tread underfoot. Uh, uh, let's see the sweets out there. Some of you, give me some chocolate. Give me. I'm a salty person myself because I follow Jesus. So I'm a salty person. How many of you... Yeah, spicy wasn't an option there, Nassim. How many of you know what this is? It's salt packet. <laughs> it's called Top Ramen. You ever had Top Ramen before? This is my favorite of them. It's, uh, it's, it's the soy sauce flavor. It used to be called Oriental. Do you know how much salt's in this? I don't know. You know, the, it's the noodles and then that tiny little packet. I'll show you. 800 milligrams per serving. And there are two servings in this package. How many of you have ever eaten half of a top ramen? Ate half and said, I'm full. I can't eat the other half. I've had my serving. It's ridiculous. So when I eat one of these, I'm getting 1,600 milligrams of salt. That's 70% of my daily value. But I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. You see, top ramen's good, but if you really want to, you know, make it special, ooh, Yoshida's. Have you guys discovered the miracle of Yoshida's yet? On the eighth day of creation, the Lord looked down and said, mankind needs Yoshida's. I grew up with this stuff. It's not as common everywhere. Um, The Costco that I used to be, they sold this thing in like a you know, 64 ounce thing, you know, now I can just find this. What is, this would last me a week, George, come on. Uh, this is, this is a, 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 a marinade and it's good for baking, grilling. I use it on a lot of stuff. I put a tablespoon of Yoshida's with my top ramen. Ooh, have you ever tried it before? You'll never go back. Sweet, smoky, savory. Well, Yoshida's has a little bit of salt in it too. It's pretty much all salt actually. <laughs> 420 milligrams, that's 18 additional percent of the daily value. Now, how many of you eat your top ramen with a fork? Any forks out there using it? Oh, you poor souls. Let's see the spoons. How many of you eat it with the spoon? The spoon's the way to go because you get the soup with it with the spoon, right? Right? So you eat the top ramen. Are you guys with me here? This is deep spiritual stuff. You eat the top ramen with the spoon. Now, once the noodles are gone, you are left with this buttery, sweet, smoky sauce, right? Well, what are you going to do with that? You're going to dump it out? We don't waste food in our house. Now, Here is the, uh, you've had tortilla soup before, right? You know, now you're going to think I'm crazy. Throw some tortillas. Throw some tortillas in that sweet, smoky, buttery broth. And now we're talking, you've got a meal. There's more salt than chips, though. Another 115 milligrams per serving, and I would say I probably have at least two servings of chips. So let's add it up. Where are we at? 2,250 milligrams of salt, 98% of my daily value of salt, and I haven't even had breakfast yet. I take it serious when Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. We have a lot of salt in the American diet, and uh, that's one of the things that, by the time you're done with those chips, there's like crystals of salt, like building on the crust of the broth, and uh, it's wonderful. Anyways, salt. What is salt? 
Salt is one of the most versatile minerals and elements on the earth. As I mentioned earlier, 14,000 and growing ways that we know how to use salt and different kinds of salt. Salt, when Jesus says you are the salt, salt is one of the most versatile, adaptable, useful minerals on the earth. Salt is also extremely abundant. The United States alone has enough salt reserves that at today's worldwide consumption of salt, the United States could provide the world with salt for 100,000 years just from the salt available to the American industry. Salt is the most abundant mineral on earth. Now, you would think with it being so abundant, it would have very little value. But actually, salt is incredibly valuable because it doesn't just show up on the shore. It has to be mined. It has to be harvested. It has to be processed. It has to be refined. So throughout history, the salt industry has been one of the most robust and profitable industries in the world. In the ancient world, there were times when salt was traded for gold ounce for ounce. You got an ounce of gold, I've got an ounce of salt. You want to trade? Well, when I'm eating top ramen, I'll take that trade. The Romans were paid with salt. It, salt was part of their salary. It was called their salarium from where we get our word salary. That's where we get our word salary was from in the ancient world. They would literally pay people with salt. Whole nations have formed around the salt industry, salt taxes, salt trade. Governments have gone to war over salt. Entire empires have disappeared for lack of salt. When Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, today we see it as this little packet, you know, a little sprinkle here. We see it mostly as a culinary thing. Maybe if you're in medicine, you know that salt is heavily used in medicine. The first thing that happens when you go to the doctor, what do they do? I mean, when it's like a serious, you go to the ER. They stick a needle in your arm and they give you what? Saline. What is saline? It's salt water. It's salt water because saline opens up the vessels. It allows blood to flow. It allows medicine to flow. Um, so, um, you know, in the medical profession and in, 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 with foods, we're aware of salt. But salt was as... Now, I don't want to overstate it, but it's, it's probably an accurate analogy to say that salt was as important to the ancient world as oil is to our world. They measured inflation by the price of salt. You know, we measure inflation by the price of gas. Hey, what did you pay for gas last week? Oh, it was $4. Really? I paid $4.25. Oh my goodness. Inflation's terrible. They did the same thing with salt. Hey, did you go to the market today? Well, how much was salt? It was two more denarii than it was yesterday. Two more denarii? You mean salt? Salt was the key component of the industry, one of the key components of the ancient world industry. We just need to wrap our minds around when Jesus says you are the salt, it was more fundamental and it was more expansive than just seasoning on our, on our food. Mark 9, 50, Jesus in a similar passage says, salt is good. Salt is good. Of course, you can take anything to extremes, but he says salt is good. If the salt becomes unsalty, very similar to what he said in Matthew 5, with what will it make it salty again? Then he says, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Now, this is not hard to see what Jesus is saying. He says, have, he says salt is good and have salt in yourselves. In other words, he's saying, have goodness in you. Have virtue in you. Salt, just as salt has all these values and virtues and is a fundamental part of our industry and our economy, so also you need to have that same value and virtue and goodness in you. And in so doing, it will produce peace. This is core to the message of Jesus, that His people would follow after Him and have the same attributes and the same mission that Jesus had. What are, what are we studying right now in our quarter. Where's Mark? I just saw Mark. Where'd you go? All the way to the back, Mark. What are we studying in our quarterly? Mission in the adult quarterly. Where's John? John, we're studying mission. Jesus wants his people to have that same mission. 
Have salt in yourselves. Have that goodness because salt is good and be at peace with one another. What Jesus, when Jesus calls us salt, he is saying, you now, you, you are now the source of abundant, versatile, and valuable goodness on planet earth. You are. And you either have it or you don't. It's not an option. It's not like waking up and saying, today I'm going to have salt. I had a little yesterday, uh, but I'm not going to have much tomorrow, but I'm going to have it today. Jesus doesn't allow for that type of a negotiation. He says, you're either connected to me and receiving the virtue of God flowing through me to you, or we're disconnected and we are at enmity with one another. Now, all of the goodness that we have comes from where? It comes from God. It's not from our internal own virtues and merit saying, well, today I've got enough goodness, I don't need God. How much goodness does God have? Unlimited. The source of unlimited goodness and virtue flows through God to us, so the abundance of goodness that we have access to is unlimited. Absolutely unlimited. The blessings that He wants to flow through us to other people is unlimited. It's to be versatile. It's to be alert and prepared for what need that goodness might have at any given time. And it is the only thing of highest value in this world, which is in you. You are the salt. You are that which provides preservation, seasoning, healing, beauty, cleansing. We're going to go through all 14,000. Are you ready? Melts ice, makes ice cream. You are the salt. And no one else is. If you're not the salt, no one else is taking up. It's not Republicans that have been called to be the salt. It's not Democrats that have been called to be the salt. It's not secular people who've been called to be the salt. Believers in Jesus Christ, listening to the Holy Spirit, you are the salt. You are the source of blessing to this earth. God desires to do a work through you. It, to, to sum it up in a way, we could go through all the, the uses of salt, but for practical, pragmatic purposes, salt in the ancient world basically made everything better. Whatever the issue was, salt made it better. Wounds, you know they used to rub babies in salt. When babies were born, they would rub them in salt. It would soothe the skin. It was considered kind of a nurturing thing to do to babies. Salt makes things better. When Jesus says you're the salt, he says your job is to never leave a situation worse once you've interacted with it, but to make it better. Now think about this. Did Jesus Christ make things better? It wasn't necessarily meant to be a trick question, but Nassim, thank you for bailing me out there. Everyone who interacted with Jesus left that experience, if they were open, if they were willing to listen to Him, in a better state than they were when they began. Yes, people that hated Him and rejected Him did not like Him, but Jesus at least gave them the opportunity to see the mercies of God, and they chose whether they were going to accept it or not. But everyone who was looking for God, everyone who was open to the work of God, they received blessings and healings and encouragement and inspiration and feeding and clothing and hope and love. They received joy from being in the presence of Jesus. Jesus never left a single soul without blessing it. That was his mission. And Jesus says, you have that same mission. You are the salt. You should never leave a conversation, a, a relationship, a business transaction, a, a random meeting on the street without my power flowing through you and you making that situation better. Christians should make things better. Whatever that thing is, friendship, talking to someone in the store. That's why Paul said, 
pray and be on the alert in prayer. You never know when God is going to bring someone into your path that you weren't expecting, but because you have been united with the heart of God through prayer, then His Word, His grace, His seasoning, His goodness flows through you to that situation. They're not always planned out. They're not always things you can prepare for. But Jesus, the very first metaphor that he gives to the church when he opens up his mouth to speak right after the Beatitudes is friends, disciples, believers, Christians, you are the salt of the earth. And it's a high calling. Remember how Paul said, let your speech always be with grace? He said, well, come on. Always? Well, what about that time I hit my thumb with the hammer? I mean, there was some... But you know, are you sure? What about when that guy drove by me and, and, and cut me off and I started giving him hand signals? Is that, is that allowed? Apart from the power of God, what Jesus asks of us, what Paul asks of us, what the Bible calls of us, it is impossible. It's a joke. It's an absolute joke. I can't always have grace. I can't always be salt. I'm going to fail at times. But God says, don't make that your norm. Come to me in prayer. Come to me in devotion. Come to me in worship. Let me mold you. Let my spirit flow through you because I'm preparing you to be salt. Be salt in the earth. Be a blessing. The church should make things better. Have we always succeeded? Of course not. Individually, socially, corporately, We've not always succeeded. But the challenge is still there. The calling is still there. The idea is still there. Our existence on planet Earth is to prepare this world and preserve this world and season this world until Jesus Christ comes. Amen? If we cease to be salty, there's no reason for us to be here to be anymore. This is our purpose, to live in this world and to have the ministry of Jesus Christ, to make sure everyone that we come into contact with is better off because of it. I'm going to anonymously tell you a story, someone who was just telling me that they were having a business meeting, and the head of that business meeting, somehow the conversation turned to swearing. And the head of that meeting said, there's really no problem with swearing. As a matter of fact, I teach my children to swear, and I teach them how to do it in the right context, and I allow that to happen because there's nothing wrong with swearing. Is that being a blessing? Is that, is that what we are called to be, is, is to learn how to use these vices? And by the way, we should always be careful of the human mind. We can justify anything right? When we lash out at someone, we say, well, I'm being salt because I'm telling them how dumb they are. They need to know just how ridiculously foolish they are, and that's how God's using me right now. And it's not because that's what God is really doing, but because we've convinced ourselves of that. It's a high calling, guys, but it's the only calling for God's people. How are you proving that you are the salt of the earth. Oh, just a couple of verses. We all familiar with Abraham's calling, I'll make you a great nation, I'll bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. That is not a maybe. That is not if, it's, if you feel like it. This is a command. This is an expectation. This, so what Jesus says about salt is not some radical new thing in the New Testament. This had been God's plan from the beginning. I'm raising you up as a nation so you can bless. In Zechariah, you have a similar statement. Right after they come out of Babylon, uh, God says it'll be just as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah. They were cursed because they weren't following God and they went into captivity. But God, but God says, but I'm going to save you. And we say, praise the Lord that he saves us when we are foolish. He comes and saves us. Hallelujah. But notice what he says. I will save you that you may become a blessing. Jesus Christ did not die on the cross. And, and go through that sacrifice so that we can simply be receivers of that blessing and say, thank you very much, Lord. I'm going to keep it to myself and I'm not going to let anyone else experience that. Jesus says, now that you've received my grace, now that you understand my mission, I am making you the salt 
to bring salvation to everyone else. That is your purpose. That is your mission. And do not fear. Let your hands be strong. You're the salt. Sulat, you're the salt. Vince, you're the salt. Irma, Caleb, wake up. You're the salt. Pratiba, you're the salt. Ken, missed you for Sabbath school, brother, but you're the salt. George, Johnny, you are the salt. If you love Jesus Christ, if He's your Savior, you're the salt. Not very much salt over there, but you're the salt. And it just comes down to a fundamental question. Are you living up to it? Are you a blessing? Are people better off from having you as a neighbor? Are they encouraged because you live next to them? Are people better off at your work? Are people better off when you go to school? Are people better off when you come to church? Are you improving and blessing the lives around you? Oh, it's so easy when we drive because we're anonymous, you know. But even when you drive, you know, I've, I've often said, if the New Testament were written in, in today's day and age, uh, the, the apostle would have written, watch how you drive instead of watch how you walk. Are you the salt? Because if you're not, Jesus says, I can't use you. And you don't understand who I am. You are the salt. Now you say, but this is impossible. I can't, I can't be those things at all times. I think it's just one more slide. Would you hit it for me? So I'm going to give you this verse at the, at the end. Jesus gives another metaphor. Truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, not much bigger than a grain of salt, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing, nothing will be impossible to you. When you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can be the salt. How many of you say, I want to be the salt that Jesus Christ has called me to be? I want to be a blessing. I want this world to be better off because of what God has done through me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you so much today. And you give us right at the outset of this beautiful, powerful sermon. You start with this dramatic analogy, this metaphor. And you use something so common that we sometimes forget about all of the applications and meanings it can have for us. But in its simplest form, Lord, I think it's clear. You want us to have your mission and you want us to be the source of abundant, versatile, and treasured, valuable goodness to this world. Help us, Father. There are so many problems in this world. We can't solve them on our own. We don't have the power to simply change every heart and every mind. But Lord, you still have a purpose for each and every one of us. It could be just one relationship that you want to work through us to improve. Just one soul that you want to bless through us. Just one person that you want to save through us. One blessing. So God, help us. Help us to trust in you. Help us to do the impossible and to always have our lips filled with praise and grace and our lives a source of abundant blessing to those around us like salt. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you guys so much for being here. Hope to see you at Potluck if you can make it. And next Sabbath for sure.